This is a video production from Purdue University's Center on Religion and Chinese Society. Visit us on the web at purdue.edu slash crcs. Freedom of religion is enshrined in the Chinese constitution with legal provisions for five officially recognized religious groups, Buddhism, Taoism, Protestantism, Catholicism, and Islam. However, the Chinese government, led by the Chinese Communist Party, is officially atheist and religious activity is tightly controlled and monitored. Recent years have brought a string of crackdowns on religion, including military intervention in western China's predominantly Muslim Xinjiang province, and the widely publicized destruction of church rooftop crosses in the eastern Zhejiang province. CRCS director and Purdue professor of sociology Feng Gang Yang has monitored conditions in China for decades. In China, religious persecution uh, was most severe during the Cultural Revolution, when all religions were banned. Uh, since 1979, uh, there has been an increase of uh, religious freedom. Uh, there are churches, temples, and mosques were reopened, and uh, actually all of the major religions have been growing and they have uh, greater freedom uh, to practice their religion. But in recent uh, four or five years, there's a clear increase of restrictions imposed on uh, religions and especially on uh, uh, Christian churches and the Christians. Those unfamiliar with religion in China may not realize the extent of religious growth in the region. As China experiences a religious resurgence, the issue of religious freedom takes on an increased importance. Since 1979, uh, when all relig uh, the five major religions were allowed to reopen their venues for uh, relig religious services, uh, I would say there have been a um, revival or revivals uh, across the board. Uh, you know, all religions have been growing have come back. Uh, nowadays in China, if you go visit China, uh, in many uh, cities you will see uh, Buddhist temples and uh, Muslim mosques and the Christian churches. Uh, it, uh, they have become more and more visible to the public. And also there are so many people attending those uh, venues, those churches and temples and the mosques. Uh, for uh, Christianity, I think the fastest growing religion in China today is Protestantism, Protestant Christianity. Uh, around 1980, there were about 3 million Protestants and 3 million Catholics. Uh, according to the Pew Research Center's report of global Christianity, uh, by 2010, there were about 58 million Protestants and 9 million Catholics. So the growth has been extraordinary uh, for Protestant Christians. Uh, it's a, really an indication of the increased freedom. Most Christians could practice uh, religion either in the officially sanctioned churches or in the so-called house churches. Those are not approved by the government, but nonetheless they exist. Um, uh, they have uh, quite a bit of freedom to do that. Professor Yang reflected on conditions in China in a recently published article in the Review of Faith and International Affairs. That article is titled, From Cooperation to Resistance, Christian Responses to Intensified Suppression in China Today. The primary goals of this article are to establish the uh, typology uh, about how do Christians respond, respond to persecution or restrictions and also describe uh, the growing trend of resistance in recent years. Um, so in this article, I distinguish three approaches, or three strategies that Christians use to respond to uh, restriction and persecution. Uh, uh, these three approaches or strategies are cooperation, accommodation and resistance. For each of the three strategies, there are two ways 
uh, within each. That is, there are uh, active cooperation versus passive cooperation. There are uh, active accommodation and a passive accommodation. Uh, there's a, uh, active resistance and a passive resistance. Uh, let's begin with uh, cooperation. Um, when uh, the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, uh, there were Christians who really shared some of the political goals of the Communist Party, uh, including anti-imperialism, anti-feudalism, uh, uh, construct a beautiful future society uh, where there's equality and freedom. So there are those uh, uh, active cooperation among some of the Christian leaders. I call them embracers, who embrace uh, at least some of the political goals of the Communist Party. Uh, a example is uh, Wu Yaozong, past, uh, yeah, Pastor Wu Yaozong, who used to be a uh, leader uh, in the uh, Christian Young Men's uh, Association. And he led the movement that uh, later on is called the Three Self Patriotic Movement. And he became the chairman of the National Committee of this movement in 1954. Uh, he is uh, an example of an embracer who really embraced some of the uh, I, uh, political goals of the party. Um, then there are those uh, who cooperated, but they cooperated not because they share much of the political goals of the party, but more out of uh, Christian love. That is uh, like uh, uh, in the Bible, uh, it, uh, uh, Jesus uh, told his uh, disciples, uh, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. They realized that in the People's Republic of China, they have to work with the party. But so it's kind of forced to go one mile, but they go the second mile to show the Christian love. I call those people as second milers. Uh, so that's about uh, cooperation. And uh, accommodation is uh, really in the middle. Uh, but there are those, uh, also there are two types of uh, Accommodation. Accommodation became actually the, the official policy of the Chinese Communist Party in the 1980s. Uh, uh, they say uh, we want uh, religion and socialism co co accommodate to each other. Uh, among Christians, I would say some of them really are active uh, accommodators uh, who accommodate really they think the existing rules regulations are really good have allowed uh, very substantial freedom of uh, religious belief and practice so they affirm those rules and regulations and they abide by those and uh, so they are enthusiastic supporters of this policy so many in the three self uh, uh, patriotic uh, com uh, movement committee, uh, this type of uh, pastors. Uh, and there are also others who, again, more passive in their accommodation. They know they have to follow the rules, regulations, otherwise they may not be able to operate above ground. Uh, but these people, uh, they think uh, the Great Commission is very important. They have to evangelize regardless of the conditions. Uh, for them, uh, their accommodation uh, is really, okay, I will follow the rules uh, whenever is possible, as long as I can do evangelism. But at the, sometimes I have to do evangelism even though the rules uh, have some restrictions. I, ha I may have to go beyond that. 
uh, for these people, uh, I would say they also follow uh, the Bible. Uh, just like uh, Jesus told their uh, disciples, saying, I'm sending you uh, out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So these are the people I call a smart accommodation. They uh, work in the uh, churches that are approved by the government. They are uh, their uh, pastor uh, uh, ordination is approved by the government, but they do evangelism uh, that they may not limit themselves within the premises of the religious values. Uh, but actually that was the rule, that you cannot do anything religious outside the religious premises. That restriction is not well observed by many people within the three self churches. Um, so that's the second strategy of uh, accommodation. The third uh, strategy uh, is uh, resistance. But resistance, uh, there are two major types. Uh, uh, one resistance is repassive. That is, you do not follow the rules, regulations, but you also do not uh, confront the authorities. Instead, you avoid them whenever, po whenever it's possible. Uh, back in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, many Christians who wants to maintain their religion had to go to underground. You know, basically going to underground is this passive resistance. Um, uh, but they really uh, avoid uh, the police and fled to places, uh, to other places when they were um, uh, when they were sought by the police. Uh, and also uh, in the 1980s and the 1990s, uh, there are some, yeah, actually first uh, in, the, in the 1980s, 1990s, there are many house church uh, systems in the rural areas. Uh, there were so many stories that those Christians uh, the leaders were jailed, and then as soon as they could, they would fled to other provinces, to remote areas, to the mountains, but continued their practice and even uh, did evangelism. Uh, during that time, there were also urban house churches, uh, like uh, in uh, Guangzhou City, there was uh, uh, Samuel uh, Lam, uh, Lin Xian Gao, and uh, he did, uh, he, uh, he, hold, uh, he has a house church at his own apartment. Uh, police rounded that up uh, several times, uh, taken away uh, their sound system, you know, ordered him to stop. He says, you know, I cannot stop. You can take me back to the prison, but I won't stop. And if you take away the sound system, we just purchase another set. Similarly, like in Beijing, there was also Yuan Xiangchen, Alan, Alan Yuan, uh, had a house church at his own home. Uh, Similar, they wouldn't challenge the authorities, but they wouldn't uh, follow the order of, uh, to stop uh, uh, their worship service. Uh, then among the uh, resistors, uh, in uh, beginning in the late 1990s, but especially in uh, the 21st century, in the last two decades very much, uh, there are more and more Christian leaders uh, become uh, challenging to the authorities. Uh, one example is uh, in Wenzhou. Uh, for a long time, uh, you know, because of the policy uh, implies that you cannot let uh, young people uh, under age 18 to come to church or temple or mosque. Um, so Sunday school would be considered illegal. Then there are some Christian leaders in Wenzhou said, you know, where is the, the law about this? Really, do you have a law 
uh, formal law, or do you have a, a clear regulation to prohibit this? Uh, so they took the local United Front Department and the Religious Affairs Bureau to the court, saying, show me the law. And of course, they couldn't win the case, right? But after that legal challenge, Sunday, school, uh, Sunday schools became uh, accepted. Uh, 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 many churches had Sunday schools for children, and since then. Another case is uh, in 2005, there was the regulations of religious affairs, uh, uh, new regulations that became effective in March of 2005, saying, yeah, you can uh, register your church uh, with the government, uh, uh, that you do not have to go through the three self uh, committee. So there's a house church in Beijing that's uh, developed by young professionals. These are new uh, new converts, uh, college graduates, many of them. There are uh, engineers and lawyers and uh, professors at universities. They say, yeah, we want to be uh, law-binding Christians, but we just don't want to join the three self-committee. And uh, we want to register with their government. Now you have the new regulations, so we want to follow this and become legalized. Uh, actually, that, that congregation already um, uh, by 2005 became quite large. There are, you know, two or three hundred people uh, gathered in an office building's hall. In a hall, in a, uh, uh, that's a quite a large congregation. It's not so-called house churches uh, like in the past uh, at people's apartments. Um, but interestingly, um, their application uh, of registration was rejected saying, oh, you have to, uh, your pastors have to be approved, uh, certified by the three uh, self-committee. Basically, the regulations made it practically not possible to become legalized without joining the three self-committee. Uh, but those people said, you know, we are following the regulations you have enacted. Now as you the government uh, has violated your regulations. So they, uh, uh, you know, uh, went up uh, to a higher uh, uh, government, uh, the Beijing uh, city municipality government, and but basically they couldn't get it through. Actually, uh, that uh, church called the Shouwang Church, that church has been uh, 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 very much suppressed. Uh, the senior pastor uh, has been under de facto house arrest since 2011. So it's already six years under house arrest. And the, the outside world seems to have forgotten about him. Uh, but that's a case that uh, Christians began to challenge the, uh, uh, the authorities. Recently, uh, in Zhejiang province, um, uh, between uh, late nine, uh, 2013 and early 2016, uh, the authorities took down uh, crosses from church rooftops. About, uh, about 1,500 of the crosses are, were taken down. Some churches were demolished completely. Um, uh, many churches saying, why do you do this? Uh, and what's the, what's the law that uh, allow you to do this kind of demolition? Well, the Zhejiang authority says, you know, this is, for, this is a policy, this is for beautification, the land beautification. Uh, we are not targeting Christian churches, uh, but you have to follow. But what, how does the cross on top of the church violate it? the beautification of the land. And uh, more importantly, what's the rule? Where is the written regulations? And uh, there are even pastors hired lawyers to uh, fight, uh, fight in court in court. So this kind of open challenge uh, is the uh, active resistance. I see 
I have seen this active resistance significantly increased in recent years. Professor Yang's article comes on the heels of new proposed legislation governing religious affairs in China. Some observers see the new legislation as representing increasingly tight control over religion. You know, after the confrontation in Zhejiang province uh, uh, surrounding the crosses on church rooftops, uh, uh, last year in 2016, uh, in September, uh, the government, um, uh, the State Council's Legal Affairs Office released a new revised version, uh, a revised draft version of the regulations of religious affairs, trying to update the regulations of religious affairs that became effective in 2005. Because uh, since 2005, uh, uh, there are so many religions have increased uh, their uh, followers, and there are new ways of doing things, and there are new, new uh, seminaries and Buddhist academies, and there are increased uh, international exchanges. So the 2005 uh, regulations basically have, have never been effective and even become uh, less so in recent years. So they wanted to upgrade that. But it took uh, at least two years uh, for them to revise and revise. Uh, there must be several drafts. Finally, this draft was submitted by the Religious Affairs Bureau, or what they call the State Administration of Religious Affairs, uh, and they submit this draft to the State Council for, for approval. What's interesting uh, is that the State Council decided to uh, open it for public input before making it uh, uh, formalized. Uh, so in September, uh, they published this on their website and solicited uh, public input within uh, uh, a month. Uh, in that window, uh, there were many uh, reactions, uh, at least uh, so far as I, I can I tell, many Christians uh, sent in their opinions, comments. And this revised, this version, this draft version, I think if it passed, it really uh, would have very severe consequences on Christian practices. Uh, many of the uh, so-called house churches and their activities, uh, they have been operating very much in the gray area. You know, it's very, not very clear whether it's legal or illegal, but nonetheless, they have been able to do it. But under the new regulations, under this draft, all of those would become uh, defined clearly as illegal, uh, such as uh, gathering in your houses uh, for religious uh, gatherings, that can be considered illegal. If you, even you, uh, you know, landowner or the L L uh, real estate owner rent out uh, space uh, to, for those uh, Christians, and uh, uh, the landlord can be punished, can be fined. And if you uh, go to uh, international conferences, that's on religion. If it's not pre-approved by the authorities, that can be punishable. And if you uh, go to uh, uh, seminaries in the US or in Hong Kong or in Singapore to study, without uh, pre-approval, that can be considered punishable. So this new regulations, uh, in my view, is really the worst possible version that became submitted to the State Council for approval. And so as uh, that's understandable to see so many Christian leaders mobilized their um, uh, fellow believers to submit comments to the State Council's uh, website. Actually, I heard that many people even sent in registered mails in order to show that they did send in uh, their uh, comments. There also uh, was a group of uh, lawyers who happened to be Christians, and they also submitted formal 
uh, comments as you know as lawyers uh, using legal terms um, commenting specific uh, articles uh, within the reg uh, regulations at the same time they also submitted to the People's Congress that's supposed to be the legislature uh, in China saying this uh, uh, regulations uh, from the state affairs, uh, state administration of religious affairs trying to pass these regulations, it may have violated the law, the law of making laws and the, the constitution. So they requested the People's Congress to stop the process of, uh, of the, uh, making the regulations. We'll see. Uh, uh, more than six months ha have passed. We st I ha still haven't seen uh, the revised regulations being uh, formalized and uh, released. Um, we'll see when this will become uh, released and uh, become effective. Professor Yang's recent article is available in the first 2017 issue of the Review of Faith and International Affairs. For more information on Purdue's Center on Religion and Chinese Society and to stay up to date on news and research on religion in China, visit purdue.edu crcs.